start. Uh, my name is Dominika uh, Czerniawska and I am a member of uh, Polon Polonium uh, Foundation. Uh, and uh, I'm very happy to welcome you uh, all to our next uh, webinar. As you may know, uh, the pandemic has forced us to postpone uh, our Science Polish per Perspective uh, conference. And hopefully, if, uh, uh, if everything goes uh, according to plan and uh, pandemic will, uh, will, be, will, will not improve any, anymore, uh, we will have another uh, conference in May 2021. But before we, before we will be able to meet, see each other uh, and talk in a larger, uh, larger gr group, we have organized a series of uh, uh, scientific webinars. And the topics uh, on the, uh, on the, during those seminars varies from life sciences, hard sciences to, to social, uh, to social uh, sciences. Before I introduce today's speaker, I would like to remind you uh, that all the information about upcoming webinars are available on our Polonium uh, Foundation website. Uh, we are continuously planning our next events, so the website will be updated uh, on a regular basis. Apart from uh, the website, news uh, on the webinars will be posted on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, we are also very excited to have NAVA, the Polish uh, National Agency for Academic Exchange, as our uh, partners. We also encourage you to sign up uh, to our uh, portal poloniumnetwork.org, uh, which aims to uh, bring together uh, scientists, Polish scientists uh, working uh, around the world. So, without any further delay, uh, please, well, uh, please welcome today's speaker, uh, Professor Barbara Czerniawska. And uh, I'm sure that if you are uh, a social scientist, Professor uh, Czerniawska needs no introduction. Uh, but, but I expect that uh, because we are such a diverse community, some people might not be familiar with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, Barbara's uh, work. Uh, so Professor, uh, Professor Czerniawska is one of the most distinguished uh, organizational uh, scholars and for sure one of the most uh, distinguished uh, uh, organizational scholars of uh, Polish origin. She has studied in Warsaw, then she moved to, uh, uh, to Sweden when she uh, currently uh, works. She has been recognized for her research on uh, the emergence and adaptation of uh, institutions organizational change, but also, and uh, which is particularly uh, interesting, uh, uh, through introducing new methodological approach to organizational uh, research. Today, however, we will uh, learn about her new research on, uh, on fake news. There will be time for questions uh, from the audience at the, uh, at the end of the talk. Uh, to ask a question, please use raise hand function that uh, shows uh, up when you click on the uh, participant list. Uh, you can also uh, just uh, then unmute yourself and ask the question. Uh, or you can uh, also uh, just use a chat box, uh, post the question and I will uh, read it uh, out loud. So we'll have about uh, 40, minutes for, 40 minutes for the pre presentation, and then we will move uh, forward to, uh, to the question and uh, Q&A uh, part. Uh, all right, I think uh, everything is uh, clear now. Uh, Barbara, are you ready to, to, share your, uh, to share your screen? Okay. Hello, it's everybody. Perfect. Can you hear me? Can you see me? I can see some of you. Oh, wow. Nina. Hi. No, I'm sorry. I should be. I know many of you, so I, I will not be mentioning all the names, but I'm very, very happy to see you. Although I would prefer to see you in real life, I do admit. And I thank Polonium for inviting me here. And I'm very curious 
and waiting for your comments more than questions because I'm sure that in the audience now there are a great many people who know more than I do or you know so when we put our knowledge together I think it would be it would be good for me at any rate so how did I uh, become interested in that well as you, many of you know I grew in I had grown up in Poland and at that time when I was living in Poland um, everybody was suspicious of fake news and now apparently from what I'm reading in certain newspapers at any rate fake news are consumed with any without any difficulty so I asked myself how what happened how come So um, I'm, of course, uh, not very original in this interest, as William Davis uh, formulated it, we live in a time of political fury and hardening cultural divides. But if there is one thing on which virtually everyone is agreed, it is that the news and information we receive is biased. I will return to the reflections by Davis, which I find very interesting. But uh, before I do that, and before I continue, I would like to introduce a sort of short definition of, what, of that, what I understand by fake news, quoting Laser et al. We define fake news to be fabricated information that mimics news media content in form but not in organizational process or intent. I start with history and the history of Poland. I mean, this is a, a poster from 1981. It says in Polish, from the darkness of the Middle Ages, a crusade against Poland. And you can recognize Reagan first, and then Eisenhower, and then, you know, all this, uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, Knights of the Cross that were uh, a, a true uh, a crusader against Poland many centuries ago. So, um, it's, there is a very interesting, there are several TV programs and books written by a, a Polish journalist, Teresa Turańska, uh, and she wrote a book which in English is called Them, Stalin's Polish Puppets. And uh, what she did, she, she interviewed the TV presenters and asked them whether they believed in what they said when they were speaking about these fantastic um, achievements of the um, industry or whatever it was they were lying about. And interestingly enough, they said that not at the beginning, but later, yes, because the, the sort of a managing the cognitive dis dissonance was too hard. But she also interviewed the uh, top politicians from, from those times, and they answered completely differently. I mean, one with one exception. They said that they did, even after they were demoted purged, humiliated, humiliated, or turned into non-persons. But as I, as I mentioned before, the journalists did not believe it at the beginning, and they stopped belie believing it at the end. But, well, uh, I became, became interested into uh, seeing how was it in other countries. And very soon I discovered that the, the history, I mean, that the, neither Poland nor other countries dominated by the Soviet Union were exceptional fake news producers. Everybody did it. So uh, as the Swedish historian Dick Harrison said, Swedes produced massively fake news already in the 1400s. And then Cardinal Richelieu apparently launched a newspaper 
to spread government propaganda in 1631. But also in 1630, he spread the news that the king was against him. And when his opponents gathered publicly to celebrate it, it was very easy to get rid of them. Does that remind you of something that happened recently? Well, I thought it might. In 1977-2, the Reverend Henry Bate founded the Morning Post, a newspaper that piled news paragraph upon paragraph, much of it fake, says Robert Darton. And then when you come to, to our times, I mean, it's already in 1904, uh, US journalist Horace White asks, the question arises at this point, why there are so many black sheep in journalism? Why so many fakes? Why is the epidemic of yellow journalism so prevalent? A very bad type of journalism. And you see on the picture that all these uh, journals are, are yellow. Uh, apparently, the very term fake news has been coined in 1930s when the U U US newspaper used it to describe pro-fascist propaganda which was coming from public relations firms employed, uh, paid by the Nazis. And then closer to, to the present, uh, US sociologist Burstyn in the second edition of his book, The Image, gave it a subtitle, A Guide to Pseudo Events in America. This, um, Pseudo events in, in the vocabulary of Norman Mailer uh, were called factoids. And his definition of factoids were facts which have no existence before appearing in a magazine or a, of a newspaper or a newspaper. So you see, the history of fake news is quite long and quite solid. I'm not quoting it here, but I recently read that Napoleon was famous for sending fake news from battlefields. So that, you know, they, even journalists knew that he was lying and they were very careful trying to, to repeat what he said. So how is it today? Is it the same phenomenon? I have interviewed my colleague who for a long, in Poland, who for a long time held a prominent position in the management of one of the central news agencies in Poland. I'm quoting him here anonymously. So I asked him quite openly, who are the producers of fake news in Poland now? Are these old specialists in such production? Because this is what I suspected actually. Or are these young journalists who learned from the old ones? or the young ones that learn from other countries' examples. And this is what he said. Don't forget the so-called mediatization of politics with the result that the media no longer aspire to the role of information provider, impartiality of communication, etc. TV National, who is in Poland a private competitor of the public TV, simply says, we are a commercial company and under the terms of the license, there is no question of the obligation to provide impartial information. Public media have a statutory obligation to ensure an impartial balanced message, message because they're financed not from advertising, but from public funds. But now their bosses say, we need to balance the message that goes to the public, which should be read as if they, the commercial, commercial media can do so, so will we. But, says my interviewee, fake news is produced not so much by journalists as, pol as by political activists. 
and knowing that young people are doing better on the internet and new technologies and, and no, do better or use better the new technologies than old ones, I guess they are rather young. Probably internet trolls that propagate their own beliefs or act on someone's order. So how is it in other countries then? Well, even my um, interviewee introduced this uh, uh, differentiation, which I find quite interesting between deep fake versus soft fake. I mean, sort of like not very important uh, news that are fake or not. But I also found in the literature a very interesting uh, suggestion by Alessandro Barocco an Italian sociologist who's, who introduced the terms of fast truths. And this is what he says. Each morning, many truths wake up and all have the sole objective of surviving, to be known, to reach the surface of the world. The truth that survives will not be the one more exact and precise, but the one that travels faster, that reaches the surface of the world first. And one of his examples was that uh, at certain point that they, uh, so forget the, uh, a certain point that's important, that vinyl discs sell more than digital music. But what was not mentioned in this news was that it was, yes, true, but in one week, and in one place in the UK. All this was not put into the news. So in that sense, I uh, favor the um, expression disembedded, disembedded news, because uh, then this kind of disembedded news can be re-embedded in the context that fits the commentator. So anybody can put it sort of in, in the context that suits her um, or him. But then what about the reception of fake news? Well, when I still lived in Poland, I, I didn't buy any newspapers and I, co I mean, sort of consulted them only when I know, wanted to know what movies are being played in what movie theater. But there were also um, satirical weeklies that were sort of uh, careful about what they satirized, but they were quite funny. And they were doing sort of, uh, they were making fun of um, everything that was not sort of um, politically delicate. Then many people were getting their news from so-called Radio Free Europe. I remember my father putting on the in the evening, uh, putting on the Radio Free Europe, which was uh, uh, getting news in, in Polish uh, for anybody who wanted to, to hear. But of course, you had to be careful about your uh, neighbors and things like that. But there was a general distrust of the official news. So has it changed now? Is it better? Is it worse? So in a sense, sometimes it's worse because it is better. So I'm, I have two quotes here. There is a Professor Rafał Pankowski who, who started this phenomenon and he says, what we have now is cruder, more primitive and more aggressive than anything that was broadcast at that time. But Olga Tokarczuk says, what is now is much worse because the propaganda is much smarter nowadays. How is it, how are this uh, fake, how is the fake news received in Poland nowadays? The a journalist from a daily Gazeta Wyborcza made interviews on the streets and asked them what do they think about the you know, fake news and, and how they react to it? And 
most of people answer that they don't have time and they don't 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 want to to check the sort of correctness of the news so here is a single mother of two children who was uh, who was asked that by a journalist and she answered i don't care about fake news i care about what i will give children to eat thanks to the present government i can give them harm a university employee had a completely different answer. I don't listen to the radio and don't watch the TV. Bullshit, all of it. Well, maybe it's not completely different as you notice. They both say they, they don't care, simply. What my interviewee suggested, which, which I found quite convincing, is that they uh, for those who sort of who who receive and even believe in in fake news uh, there is this sort of the need for strong sensations and he said it's a bit like in the middle ages where there were no electronic and mass media so the public and the storytellers adored the public executions but then before we at all, uh, we're asking a question which I find rhetorical. Was there ever a time when appeal to emotion was less significant than objective facts? Yeah, well, I think we, we all know the answer. So how is the reception of fake news go, doing and going in, in the other countries than Poland. Well, again, the Foroway has all said, suggested that changes in the economy of information have facilitated the dramatic, targeted and purposeful spread of fabricated information. This has led to the emergence of myriad of fake news websites, which mimic official news outlets, but spread false stories often driven, driven by political agendas or financial interests. This widespread proliferation of disinformation has made it even more difficult for the public to tell the truth from untruth and information from disinformation. And again, Olga Tokarczuk in her Nobel speech, information can be overwhelming and its complexity and ambiguity give rise to all sorts of defense mechanisms, from denial to repression, even to escape into the simple principles of simplifying ideological party line thinking. If I were to try a sort of a, a, a tentative and a very general conclusion from what I read and what I observe is that simply psychology hasn't changed. Uh, the emotional use of rhetoric always wins over logic, but the technology did. And here is uh, the uh, fragment uh, quotation from the speech of John Le Carré when he was receiving the Olaf Palm Prize uh, um, earlier, I mean, the last year. Today, Orwellian lie machines that would have made Josef Goebbels blush as they wear down our decency, our common sense, and drive us to question incontestable, incontestable truths. So the question, um, well, yeah, and the what, what is also happening at the same time is uh, that the fake news are very good for the uh, conspiracy theories. Uh, this is already almost a year 
old, but it didn't change. So this is what the South China Morning Post was saying on the, in the February 2020. With a potential global pandemic and geopolitical rivalry between the two, two superpowers, conspiracy theorists are having a field day. And as they, as they continued, conspiracy, conspiracy theories have been spreading faster than the new coronavirus. Generally, though, they fall under two categories. <clears throat> the first, the virus is a bioweapon engineered by Chinese who accidentally leaked it. Or number two, it was created by Americans who deliberately released it. And the, the first theory was apparently spread by Bill Gertz of the Washington Times, whose motto is observe real trusted news. And his story was based almost entirely on an Israeli biological war warfare expert, one Danny Shohan. But in Hong Kong, Blue Ribbon YouTube influencer, Jonathan Ho Chi Kwong, who has 210,000 subscribers, has been claiming for weeks that the virus was released by Washington as a part of a multi-pronged war against China. After all, practically all the deaths have been Chinese on the mainland. And later on, I've learned that the sort of new um, anti-fake news unit in the UK was dealing already in March, at the end of March, with up to 10 false coronavirus articles a day. I must say that the productivity of these people are, is amazing. We uh, scientists should learn from them how to run so quickly and so, so many things. Sorry, that was a poor joke. I withdraw it. So now seriously, what to do? Well, those 16 social scientists who signed the article in Science in 2018 suggested two kinds of interventions. First, helping individuals to check the facts. And uh, in Finland and in Sweden, there are educational experiments training young people to discern fake news. Uh, today, I've been reading, no, actually yesterday, I was reading the Chronicle of Higher Education. Um, with, there was a, 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 a blog called Teaching in the Age of Disinformation, and uh, this was uh, uh, by Beth McMurtry, and what, what the, the author was saying that the colleges might do everything to teach students how to uh, take, I mean, to tell the fake news from the correct news. Well, absolutely, but I would suggest that it, it's a bit late to, to start it in the college. I mean, it should, it should start in, in schools. I don't know, maybe even in, in the daycare centers. Then the uh, scientists uh, in, in, with laser at all, they suggested two types of structure interventions, which I think are very, very important and very relevant. On the one hand, quality checks at popular platforms. Um, one of the Swedish journalists now uh, wrote a, an article with sort of provocative uh, a, a suggestion that, I mean, a provocative uh, title that um, uh, Twitter and uh, Facebook and Instagram should not be uh, allowed to, to, to stop uh, the accounts and things like that. So at the beginning, you assume that the, it was sort of a, a populist protest, but what he meant is that they should, it, it should be somebody else, some other authorities that already is checking what they are doing and not doing and not 
that we should be waiting for their sort of consciousness to, to wake up and, and do something. So this was this, this other more important structural interventions, governmental regulation of such platforms. So, and also be the scientists writing in science, of course, they added that both the platforms and the authorities should collaborate with independent academics from a variety of disciplines and together be looking for answers to the questions, how can we create a new ecosystem and culture that values and promotes truth? Well, I have learned personally, I have learned at least two things from all this reading and checking and observing what is happening. First of all, I mean, personally and privately, I promise myself to never share an unread article on Facebook. You know how it is, you see the headline that seems very promising, so you share it. And then of course, well, I have to, to, to admit that it was not only my, my um, fantastic, uh, uh, good character that made me do it. I've, I've made a mistakes. Like I, I shared something as the latest news and somebody pointed out to me that this was from 2016, for example, or something like that. So, you know, you also learn from your own errors, but I think it's, it's quite, uh, quite important. And I understand it's, I agree absolutely with my interviewee from Poland who said that people are sort of either too lazy or don't, don't feel like checking everything. But okay, if you don't check, then don't share. And also in sort of professional context, and you don't have to agree with me, but I, I've been truly convinced by, by si Simon Chapin, and I will, I will use truth in psychological meaning only. And I will be speaking about something that is correct or not correct in, in other contexts. After all, as Karin Knorsetina reminded us, the word facts comes from Latin facere, which means fabricated, being made. So, you know, we cannot have any kind of truth which is a mirror of nature, to quote Roger. But, uh, and also somebody said, we know, you know, we, nobody will be able to check everything. We have to decide to check who did what to check the uh, correctness, correctness or not correctness of, inf uh, of an information. So, well, I'd like to end my presentation with a, a topic or suggestion of the issues to discuss. And here I come back to William Davis again. This is what he says, and I'm very curious about what you will think about it. What if we accepted the claim that all reports about the world are simply framings of one kind or another? which cannot but involve political and moral ideas about what counts as important. After all, reality becomes incoherent and overwhelming unless it is simplified and narrated in some way or other. And what if we accepted that journalists, editors and public figures will inevitably let cultural and personal biases slip from time to time? If we abandon the search for some pure and unbiased truth, where might our critical energies be directed instead? If we recognize that reporting and editing is always a political act, at least in the sense that it asserts the importance of one story rather than another, then the key question is not whether it is biased, but whether it is independent of financial or political influence. 
Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Barbara, for this very interesting, uh, interesting talk and actually revealing the complex and long lasting history of fake uh, of fake uh, news. We tend to forget that it's not a new thing, uh, actually. We already have uh, two, uh, two questions uh, for, from Michal and from uh, Michal, <laughs> but two different, uh, two different uh, Michals. Uh, they were posted uh, in the chat box, so I will allow myself to read it out loud. Again, if you have uh, any questions, use right hand, um, uh, hand uh, uh, and uh, unmute yourself. Uh, and uh, if you prefer or you, to, to type it or you can't uh, ask, ask it directly, just type it in the chat box and I will read it. Okay, Michał Gulczyński is asking, what is the psychological meaning of the truth? Right, I mean, um, I sort of remembered uh, my basic education was in psychology. So the truth is when a person is believing if what she or he is saying. So it's, as we understand, it's a very, very limited uh, understanding of truth. Okay. Uh, okay, now we have a question for, from another Michał, uh, Michał Fratzkowiak. I'm sorry if, I, if I, I'm not, um, uh, I'm, if I'm tw twisting your surnames, I'm very s sorry about it. Okay, uh, Michał, thank you for a great talk. Uh, what link uh, do you think there is between perception of news as fake, and belief in conspiracy, uh, conspiracy theories. Would you say that uh, it's one of the defense mechanism, to quote uh, Olga Tokarczuk, that people take on because of the overload and complexity of available information? Uh, partly that, but also uh, here I will quote Timothy Snyder, who was uh, writing about the American abyss quite recently, I mean, two days ago. And he says, it takes a tremendous amount of work to educate citizens to resist the powerful pull of believing what they already believe and what others around them believe or what would make sense of their own previous choices. So yeah, it, it is a sort of, a, uh, if, if you, I mean, you, you choose conspiracy theories which you want to believe in, which sort of, confirms what your friends and neighbors are saying and what you want to believe. And, and therefore you, you perceive, you know, news as correct only when they are sort of uh, in, in accordance with this, with your, with your favorite conspiracy theory. Now, okay, okay, again, privately, I mean, when I read some of those uh, conspiracy theories, I do feel that it's not a psychologist, but a psychiatrist that should be uh, help. But uh, yeah, well, people do believe in strange things, don't they? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. We have another question uh, uh, from the uh, chat box from, from Marta Urbańska. Uh, thank you for this great talk regarding the recommendations from uh, later in science 2018. Don't you think it's uh, dangerous to give the government the power to decide which news are fake? And what about the border between guard guarding the truth and freedom of speech? Marta, you know that it's a tricky question, <laughs> doesn't it? It, of course, depends on what government do you have. But I assume that the scientists who wrote in science uh, have the maybe sort of idealistic uh, assumption that we're speaking about a democratic government that is sort of a, 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 a acting according to the, to the constitution and to the institutional rules and regulations. Uh, but uh, of course, in the situation when, uh, in a different situation, uh, they should not be having this power if you ask me, which you did. <laughs> um, okay, another question uh, from, from uh, Marlena. 
why are some people more prone to believe in conspiracy theories while others are not? Well, I don't know. This is, I mean, now I, I, I withdrew from being, from claiming to be a psychologist because it's a very complicated question. I really don't know. It's, it should be, um, or maybe, maybe it is a, it is a question for sociologists. Uh, I mean, some kind of obvious, obvious uh, answers come, but, but I don't think, I mean, they're, because they are obvious, they don't explain much, you know, because they feel uh, denigrated, because they, they suffer in a sort of, they are put in sort of a, uh, they feel discriminated by other people who are having it better, because they never had a, a, an opportunity to get a proper education, and so on, so on, and so forth. But it's a, it is an interesting research question, simply. All right. Uh, not simply. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, another question from uh, Maciek Młynarski. Now we are getting more and more aware of existen existence and mass presence of fake news and conspiracy theory. One of possible answers for that ch ch challenge is developing strategy of uh, verification. So, sorry, I, I'm of uh, I'm not really, I think it's a more of a comment than... Yeah, because I agree, I will only say that strategies of verification, mm -hmm. I think that they, they need to be many. Uh, okay, another uh, qu uh, this time question from Monika Zbyt uh, Zbytniewska. I think one important aspect of limiting the impact of fake news is diversification of sources. However, that is slightly limited by the information we receive on the internet, for example, Facebook uh, is somehow uh, tailored, to ta for example, Facebook is somehow tailored to us. What is the effect of AI uh, and uh, et cetera on fake news? Okay, now you put me into the sort of another topic of interest for me about uh, robots and AI and well, I'm not sure this diversification of sources is as much a solution as a problem because that's exactly the point. I mean, it's too much. Uh, people are confused. They, they prefer to sort of listen to few rather than to, to more than before. But what is interesting, but also very sad, is that when AI was sort of permitted to be on social media and the uh, sort of... Uh, um, take part in, in, in this discussions and give information, they were it, I mean, I shouldn't say they eat probably, the um, artificial intelligence, it very quickly uh, learned all the biases and became, be, became giving sort of racist, uh, chauvinist, at what have you, the, the worst kind of a, um, messages so it had to be stopped so this is this is another problem but let's hope that our uh, robot people are working on that okay we have uh, another two questions uh, in a uh, in the chat box i just want to remind you that uh, if you want to ask uh, question directly you can use this reaction button and then there is rise hand and uh, uh, you will be given you will be unmuted uh, and uh, you can ask uh, your question directly uh, okay emma uh, rungen uh, has a has a question thank you barbara for an interesting talk i am a phd student at Uppsala, and i studied the reception of russian strategic narratives in media among young baltic russians I wonder what is your experience of uh, studying the reception of fake news? Could you elaborate a bit more? You also mentioned, mentioned it, uh, it in the end, but could you also elaborate on your connection or on your connection between narrative thinking and fake news? I think uh, these fake news or, or strategic narratives are successful because they resonate with the audience. Thank you. Well, uh, as I told you, I didn't make any experiments and I think it, it will be quite difficult to sort of study, uh, study actual 
reception in real life, but I think that your study sounds very interesting. So don't forget to inform me about, about your results when you're done. Uh, well, I would say not so much about, yeah, I would call it not to, connect it not to, to, to narrat narratology as to rhetoric. I mean, okay, I'm, I'm sorry if I, if many of you will be upset with what, what, what I will say, but even in academic debates, it's not the person who is right that wins, but the person who is rhetorically more skillful. And this is what everybody is saying about you sort of explaining the, the triumph of Trump, if you want to put it this way, that he is a very good rhetorician in, in the sort of the most populist way. I mean, I recently read about books about Cicero and uh, Cicero was often quite right, but I can, can have, the, but you know, the, the whole uh, debate, political debates they are all, all about who is a better rhetorician, who, who convinces the audiences, the listeners better. Actually, Bruno Latour said that, that our academic debates are the sort of a equivalent of what is forbidden, that is the duels that were done before. Uh, and like in the duels, it was not the person who was right that won the duel, but the one who used the tool better. So it's same in rhetorics, it's the use of tools. And as long as it sort of entertain us, uh, it's, it's fun, you know, watching it. But then uh, uh, it's about consequences in duels and in other kind of a, sort of a, uh, uh, confrontations, it could be death. But in, in, in case of those political debates and political things, well, as we have seen only a few days ago, there can be deaths too. But then, of course, in, in sort of, I allude to, to, to several questions. It con good rhetoricians convince people of whatever fake ideas they propagate. Okay, we have two questions from, from Krzysztof Durczak and then the mic will go to uh, Paula. Okay, uh, Krzysztof, uh, back in the day, if you wanted to learn news, you needed to buy a newspaper uh, in a newsstand that sh uh, shelved all the journals from left to right on the political spectrum. This has uh, been lost in the modern uh, via algorithms uh, that show us things which we would already like. Question, uh, first question, do you think that folks uh, in the old day were more resilient to fake news given uh, that the news were produced for a general audience rather than targeted group? Question two, are the folks today more prone to accept fake news because they are crafted better to address their personal affections? Um. Well, I'm not sure that folks in the old days were more resilient to fake news. But again, if I, if I can speak about Poland only, uh, there was this idea that is now propagated as a way sort of, of, of defense, uh, checking who and on what basis is saying what. This was uh, sort of uh, um, taken for granted. Uh, so in that sense, was, uh, uh, probably it was also a problem that you know, some, some so-called fake news maybe even were not fake, but the, as they were coming from a certain ty type of sources, they were taken for granted as, as incorrect. Um, but as to the second one, yeah, this is, this is what, at least I, I agree with what Olga Tokarczuk said, that this is much more sort of sophisticated uh, and uh, yeah, and, uh, and therefore it's, it's it sort of better addresses uh, the and, and targeted, as somebody mentioned too. So it's it it's, has a more convincing power. Mm, okay, Paula, uh, please unmute yourself and ask yeah. the question. Unmuted me, but that's perfect. So thanks a lot uh, for the talk. I was looking forward to it, um, and. Context really interesting. 
so I have one comment and one question. Uh, the comment the comment is about, uh, so th there was this question just before someone asked whether you would know um, why people are more, why, why some people are more attracted to, and then I don't remember, it was about fake news and cons conspiracy theories um, or something, right? But uh, about, um, you know, fake, let's say fake news. So yesterday I listened to, um, to Michał Bilevich. Uh, he gave a talk in Université de Lorraine and uh, Sciences Po. Uh, so it was broadcasted as uh, your talk is. And uh, um, he said that uh, according to their research and their investigation, so um, uh, it shows that uh, people who go to social, so, so, you ha so people can uh, get information from different sources, right? I mean, it's pretty obvious. Uh, people can read newspapers and uh, very like uh, traditional newspapers online uh, or not online, but they will be more, um, uh, more relying on information provided by uh, journalists. And then there are people who will stay in their bubble in um, social media or in internet-based uh, information portals or some um, type of uh, resources of this type. And um, they have realized that in uh, social media, so let's call it social media, uh, there is much more hate speech um, and there is much more fake news. And that people who will stay there uh, and for some reason not leave, uh, they would be more um, uh, willing to uh, after um, um, accept conspiracy theories uh, to accept, uh, for example, Islamophobic discourse, etc. So they 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 were trying to, uh, or they show the connection between the place where you get your information from, uh, and the way this information is presented, and how you are going to react afterwards. So which kind of information you are going to accept afterwards. So I mean, for me, it was very informative because that shown that. Um, people who would, um, um, I don't know, maybe being a bit lazy or for some reason just uh, get accustomed to go to social media instead of reading newspapers, uh, they would, uh, and they would stay in their bubble, um, well, they will continue uh, believing in fake news, they will continue believing in uh, conspiracy theories, and they will uh, also accept much more uh, radical opinions uh, about, for example, immigrants. So that was my comment. I don't know what you, uh, if, if you want to comment about it, but I will ask my question, and it's a very quick question, so I do it immediately. So you spoke about uh, fake news, and but my impression was that you were mixing, uh, to some extent, fake news and propaganda, because for, for me it's like you can have fake news from a very positive, <laughs> pros positive perspective. So would, according to you, fake news always be a propaganda? So that was my question. Thank you. I have no idea. I'm very sorry. I, you know, I, I think I used the definition of fake news, the one that I quoted. I mean, sort of that they um, imitate the form of news, but they are not prepared in this way. So that is a good uh, way for me to to come back to the uh, to the to your to your comment, because what what you were saying actually it, it is more like a loop, because it can be. Uh, claimed that the people who choose social media as a source of news rather than newspapers, for example, are already decided against the sort of the, the, the media, as it were. So, uh, yeah, so, so I think it goes like that. But, uh, yeah, I mean, whether fake news is always a propaganda, I cannot answer because actually... I now got uh, uh, two or three uh, new sources on, uh, which, are, which are dedicated to propaganda, but I decided that uh, I don't know enough about it yet. So I don't know. Uh, okay, we have uh, two questions. The first one is from Kasper uh, Renio. I have a question about media funding. Can crowd crowdfunding and the development of civic and democratic society be the way? Is such a model in which the community becomes responsible for its medium is good or is it too dangerous? Yeah, that's an interesting. It's a it's a 
topic that I was interested in too, but I let it be because uh, I was mostly uh, based on the sort of a Swedish situation because in, in Sweden, the crowdfunding uh, journalism is called Swish journalism. Swish is a, is a device we have to sort of pay various things via our mobile phones. And, and there is now Swish journalism. And this is used mostly by the sort of real journalist in a, in, um, like it's a, it's a second, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not truly good. But for example, in Holland, there is this, I think it's called the correspondent with this crowdfunding and it has a very good opinion, but also, and this is what the Swedish journalists point out, that it will be okay with Swiss journalists if it's very clear who is paying and for what is paying and, you know, and this should be completely transparent and the uh, sort of views, I mean, this should be the, the wide uh, the range of, of views represented rather than one skewed sort of perspective, as it were. But uh, also, you know, no way. Uh, what I was thinking that it would be one in the sort of the this technology should be could could uh, give us new opportunities to sort of uh, to to. Uh, to, not to go to social media, but sort of construct this kind of media that we want to have. And there was a project, it was supposed to be an app in which, at least in Sweden, you would be able to choose elements from different uh, newspapers and sort of produce your own newspaper. But it, it didn't come to work, apparently. No, not apparently. I guess because the as you know, the new traditional newspapers are, are rather difficult uh, financial situations now, and it would be very difficult for them to, to earn the same money if they were sort of selling only bits of the paper and not. But I think it's, a, it's an interesting possibility. Mm -hmm. But don't you don't you think it would be a sort of more, more of the same that if people had actually, uh, they would actually have the opportunity to choose which pieces of newspapers they would read, they would actually choose the only one they, they like. It would be more of Facebook, but with slightly better quality. Yeah, but see, but it's, that's the point. It's a tricky thing mm -hmm. this, when we are saying and everybody's agreeing that you have to, to, to decide what sources you, you believe and what they are saying and what for, isn't it the same as what you like? So, but you know, observe that this is a situation that you'd sort of choose it from different newspapers. So it's not for one newspaper that is saying what you're saying and from different newspapers, by definition, it will be different. Yeah. But I agree, they're still very close, but you know, we do. Um, no, I'm sorry. I always tell my students, don't say we as you represent, you said we're, we're elected representative of the whole humanity. But well, I do read that what I like to read, okay? Yeah. Okay, we have another two questions. Uh, and I think we can, we, we can take another 10 minutes. Uh, so if you have another question, I think we, co we could squeeze in one more. Uh, so, uh, uh, so okay, uh, now uh, a question from Anastasia Treumbach. Thank you, Barbara, for a great talk. I'm very interested to know more about the reception of fake news uh, varies, uh, varies cross-culturally. What do you think are the influences of political culture historical factors? Particular, particularly those who have lived under far right left regimes in the past recent generational uh, memory on currently on current attitudes to fake news. Well, uh, uh, this is a question to a historian and much I always wanted to be a historian. I can't even remember dates in a proper order. So uh, I won't be able to answer that. Uh, Timothy Snyder is doing that, and he is uh, 
of course, nobody can do all cross culture thing, but he's very good. He knows quite a lot about Europe and Eastern Europe, and he writes now quite a lot about, yeah, as I said, the American abyss. So I think I, I would recommend him to read him because uh, he's, he's very good at that, I think. Okay. Uh... I have another question from uh, Viola uh, Rymaszewicz, and then I will pass the mic to uh, uh, Martin Magnus, who I think uh, is uh, uh, rather preparing a call for action. Okay, uh, the last question from Viola. The founder of Fox News once said, we are going to share the news that our audience wants to hear. My question is, are fake news so effective because they in intrinsically create the illusion of reality that the audience is looking for? Well, no, I think. But as to the to the last question, I said uh, it's exactly but what uh, what people want to believe. But I I'd like to 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 defend the founder of Fox News because also as you know he was recently taking quite a different uh, stand because he's not saying that uh, he was speaking about selecting the news not about faking the news observe that uh, at least if this is you know the, the correct quote is the to share the news that audience wants to hear means not sharing other news but he's not he didn't say anything about faking news so so there that's a, it's an interesting uh, difference too okay thank you so the last uh, uh, participant uh, Marcin does he want us to open the Facebook yeah, uh, Martin, the floor is yours. If you want to call for action, that's a good moment. Can you find another me? Uh, I will try. Um, You have to un. Okay. Ah, okay. Okay. Ah, sorry, because I was locked out. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, I really enjoyed the talk. I also made some notes and put something on Facebook. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I asked uh, some of you if you want to join us on Facebook because there's a group of scientists of two science. So it's a small uh, group of of scientists that actually we we wanted to engage more as a scientist, engage in different discussions, and also. Uh, be able to to learn how to talk with people that they produce or maybe not produce, but actually how they how they how they discuss uh, fake news. And I think uh, I don't know if if we have any other solutions. Like we have many solutions that they involve like education, but it will take years. And in Poland, maybe it will take ages to actually uh, to actually be able to. Uh, to fight with fake, new, fake news. Uh, so our idea is that actually we have a group of scientists that we have a chat and we discuss all the crazy fake news that we are at the moment. We engage with discussions and very often we help each other. So if there is a problem, then we come and then we discuss some issues all together. If there is something super crazy profile, then we go all together as a group of 10 scientists and we do some uh, discussions over there and we try to also go into collaboration with many people that they write about science and it seems like crazy nauka for example in poland and it seems that they also enjoy that there is someone that actually you know is, is fighting for them for the truth uh, so i can only i can only say if if you want to really you know see how how it works and how to engage with people and how to actually learn how to talk with them and not just to say that they are stupid but actually to try to convince them uh, it's not very easy, and and I think we need hundreds of, of hundreds of scientists that actually, uh, you know, speak out and uh, actually are involved in this kind of initiative. So I don't know if we have uh, like very clear solutions what to do next, but maybe this is one of the one of the activities. And thank you for the great talk. Okay. 
thank you, Martin. So maybe we can wrap it up with this uh, call for uh, for for action uh, and uh, fight for truth sla slash correctness. Uh, uh, and uh, I would like to, uh, first of all, I would like to thank Barbara for this very interesting, uh, uh, interesting uh, talk and uh, uh, all our participants for being with us, uh, um, asking questions, commenting. Uh, I just want to remind you that you can follow Polonium, Polonium Foundation via the newsletter, Facebook and Twitter and Polonium Network. Uh, dot org uh, web page. I hope to see you in, uh, in I think in two weeks uh, uh, on uh, on the next uh, Polonium uh, webinar. It won't be a I don't think it's uh, I can't I can't remember really whether it's about social sciences, but I don't but I don't uh, think so. But we have another uh, social science uh, uh, webinar this uh, semester. But it's always worth popping up and listening to smart people uh, sharing uh, their research. So have a good evening and uh, thank you for uh, being with us.